And today, the First Minister and I are pleased to announce that we have appointed Fiona Ryan as Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood, Childhood Abuse. The appointment is for a five-year term, and Fiona Ryan will take up the position from the 14th of December. COSIGA is established under the Historical Institutional Abuse Act 2019. The principal aim of COSIGA is exercising functions under the Act is, uh, to promote the interests of any person who suffered abuse whilst a child and while re whilst resident in an institution at some time between 1922 and 1995. Fiona Ryan brings a wealth of experience in working with and understanding the needs of victims and survivors of trauma. She is currently the Chief Executive of Sonos Domestic Violence Charity and is also a member of the Monitoring Committee of the National Strategy for Domestic, Sexual and Gender-Based Violence in the South. The appointment of a statutory commissioner for survivors of institutional childhood abuse is a hugely significant day for all those that have been so terribly impacted and our thoughts are with those that have suffered greatly. As members will be aware, the Historical Institutional Abuse Act was enacted in November 2019. Prompt action was taken to establish the HIA Redress Board, which opened for applications on the 31st of March. Some seven weeks later, the first compensation payments were made within the timescale set out by the President of the Redress Board. This was a significant milestone for victims and survivors who are now starting to receive the compensation that they are long overdue. As at the 30th of September, 579 applications have been received, 156 of them from people who participated in the Heart Inquiry. Panels have made determinations totalling 4.144 million and paid out a total of 2.55 million. We want to acknowledge Brent McAllister's important work in promoting the interests of victims and survivors as interim advocate, including putting forward the views of victims on improvements to the legislation and advising on procedures for the redress board. The pain and the suffering of victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse can never be erased. However, this appointment is one further critical step in the implementation of the Heart Inquiry recommendations. There is still further important work remaining in the form of an apology and memorial, as well as important steps such as the implementation of support services for victims and survivors, as well as raising awareness of the redress scheme. We look forward to working with Fiona as she takes up this critical and sensitive role. Gura Magad. Gura Magad, I call Doug Beatty, Deputy Chair of the Executive Office Committee. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the ministers for uh, their statement on an extremely uh, important issue um, which, which we have to uh, move forward uh, and I thank them for the detail within that statement in particular um, about where we have progressed those cases in regards to redress. I think it's important that we know that this is going forward. Um, I, I note that Fiona Ryan will be taking over um, uh, on the 14th of December uh, and yet correspondence with Brendan McAllister said he's leaving in mid-October. Uh, could I ask the ministers, therefore, to confirm or, or address that issue uh, and confirm that the new Corsica um, will try to re-engage with all uh, of the HIA groups where there has been disengagement um, between some? Thank the member for his question. And just to say yes, so um, Ms Ryan is required to work a, a period of notice. So that's why the appointment um, won't be until the 14th of December. But obviously we look forward to that appointment. Um, it's always been the intention of the interim advocate also to um, continue to provide representation to victims and survivors until we had this new post, uh, new person in post. Um, however, officials will work with the advocate um, around the level of input required uh, as we work our way through the, the weeks ahead till we get to our permanent post. But I think today certainly represents a new chapter uh, and allows us to um, appoint, make this very significant appointment um, as, as a joint um, office. And I think that hopefully for for victims and survivors, they, they will, um, it will, it will not go unnoticed to them the significance of getting this permanent position in place and that what must be at the heart of all of that is that the victim's voice is heard. And I call Christopher Stalford. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, today does mark an important milestone. I recall, I think myself and Mr Nesbitt may be the only original members left of the old OFM, DFM committee that are still on the Executive Office Committee. This has been a long time coming, and I remember sitting with some of the victims at the launch of the Heart Inquiry and the promises that were made. We have a, an absolute obligation to see those promises fulfilled. Uh, as I say, this is one part of the package, and it's very welcome. Another part of the package, obviously, is securing funding for 
the compensation scheme, and we have a very wide estimate in terms of just how much that is going to cost. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister what updates she has had from those religious organisations who were entrusted with the care of children as to the scale of the contribution that they anticipate making to such a compensation scheme? Thank you. Can I thank the, the member for his question and, and concur that this has been a long journey? Um, and for those um, elected representatives that have worked and supported victims, you know, I commend all the work that's been done for many years to get us to this point. Um, what's important at the heart of all of this is always for us to remember that these are people who have been hurt, people who have been wronged and been wronged by many institutions. And I think it's really, really significantly important that then everybody plays their part in uh, allowing things to, to, to allow, allow us to respond um, to the needs of victims and the requests of victims. So I think the role of the other institutions is crucially important and there's been a number of um, engagements with the different institutions around redress. And as you know, um, I believe from your committee um, experience, you'll know that the current estimates for financial redress range from 149 million right up to um, 402 um, as a central kind of estimate and then even a higher estimate of 668 million at, at the upper end. So we are um, intending to hold a round table meeting with the institutions um, and to bring them round, round the table again and let's get this progressed. Let's make sure that every single uh, redress is made and let's ensure that we also progress all the other issues which include that fulsome apology, the memorial issue, the other things that were identified. Uh, and I'm determined, and certainly we as Joint uh, First Ministers are determined to make sure this work is done with um, speed. And I call Linda Dillon. Can I welcome today's announcement, first of all, and I look forward to meeting with Fiona Ryan when she is in post, just to have a conversation with her about how she will engage with victims and survivors, because that is a vital element in all of this, and, and as the, the Joint First Minister has already outlined how important that is and I think it, it really is and can't be overemphasised. And we know that there were some difficulties obviously with the interim advocate with some of the groups. So I hope in moving forward that Fiona Ryan will engage and build a good relationship with the victims and survivors. Would the Joint First Minister accept that today's appointment has been a long time coming and will you join with me in commenting the victims and survivors in their campaign for truth, justice and public acknowledgement. And would you also agree with me that this engagement and support that we have talked about with victims and survivors will be vital in terms of the memorial and acknowledgement and you know, what will be put in place around the apology because that is going to be important not only to those victims and survivors who are still with us but to the families of those victims and survivors who have passed and for those who have no interest in compensation but absolutely want somebody to acknowledge what has happened to them or to their loved one who has already passed. Gormaugut. Her question, and again, I mean, I think this is a hugely significant milestone um, for victims and survivors and their journey. And I think the, it's testimony to all of their efforts. It's testimony to them finding their voice, um, exposing the horrors of institutional abuse that, that I'm here today as Joint Head of Government making this announcement. Um, I think that you know, we all and everybody in this House will agree that in historical institutional abuse should never have happened. It was so, so wrong on so many levels. And, you know, trust was violated. Um, children, trust was breached and, and children were, were obviously violated. And it's a sad reality that so many children went through um, this experience and were forced to spend their lives carrying this like, unimaginable um, burden um, for, for, for such a long time. So I think that, you know, in recognition of the fact that Thousands of children were robbed of their childhood and they were forced to carry this um, through their lives. It's just appalling. And they were failed by a system that was supposed to be there to protect them. That's the reality. They were failed by the system. And a system that also, on many occasions, turned a blind eye to what was happening. And it covered up systemic abuse. So we need to take this opportunity to learn all the hard lessons that need to be learned about what happened in these institutions and make a pledge that this will never, ever um, happen again. I know that, um, as you have said, redress has been a long time coming. It's been far too long coming. So to all the, the victims of, and survivors of childhood uh, institutional abuse, I pay tribute, we pay tribute to your collective will, to your determination and to your resilience over many, many years. And I think it is on days like this that we turn to um, those people that have actually lost, um, that have lost their lives and, and our thoughts are with those families. And I believe that collectively across this House and indeed um, in wider society. We now also need to support and empower 
victims to move forward and assist them in rebuilding um, their lives. With the First Minister, we are committed to ensuring that all victims and survivors ensure that they get the acknowledgement, the advocacy and the, the redress that they deserve. And today, this appointment, I believe, um, carries forward that work and, and will be, begin to progress some of the things that are still outstanding. So as Fiona Wren embarks upon her work, um, working with victims, being that voice for victims and making sure that they will never be silenced again, I think this is a significant day, but we should never forget, in the midst of all of this, that it has been the courage and the tenacity and the resilience of those victims and survivors that has brought us to this stage today. Thank you. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Clearly, uh, like everyone else, welcome this appointment. This is um, overdue, uh, particularly for the thousands of people who had to endure um, appalling suffering at the hands of these various institutions. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister to say something about the uh, staffing support that Fiona Ryan will have? Uh, it's right and uh, uh, welcome, clearly, that this appointment has been made. Other appointments, as we know, haven't been made. Um, but uh, in relation to the, the, the to you, but what um, staffing support will she have in order to be the best possible advocate for um, for victims? Thanks again to the member for um, his questions. Um, I think that there are, um, in terms of the staff, there, there's been a lot of work done around um, the support services and sorry, the staff that are available to the to the interim advocate, and also I think that we have um, an obligation to look at um, the work that's being done currently, and then. What are the additional needs of the incoming um, commissioner? And she obviously will have, a, um, have, have an opinion about all of that. Um, so I think what we need to do is make sure that the commissioner is supported in the best possible way in, with the full resource that she requires in order to support victims. If we are marking this as, as a milestone, as a new beginning, and as an opportunity to address the outstanding issues, then um, certainly that I want to uh, ensure that, the, um, that the, the Commissioner herself has absolutely every single piece of support that she um, requires. There are numbers, I can't recall um, to hand, the number of staff that actually support the interim advocate and what will transfer over, but I'm happy to provide that to the, the member in ring. I call Paula Bradshaw. Mr Speaker, and I, I welcome this appointment today, although I am disappointed that the likes of Savvy and I'm assuming other um, victims groups were not advised in advance of the press statement of this appointment. Nevertheless, my question, um, Deputy First Minister, is what um, this role of, the, of this new Commissioner, will she have any remit to provide support and advocacy for those unmarried mothers who suffered abuse in mother and baby homes or children who were abused by clerics in non-institutional settings? Thank you. Well, I think just, um, Ken Corley, just we thought it was appropriate to come to the House and make a, a significant statement of this nature to, to the House. And of course, we will engage with the um, victims and survivors to make sure that they're fully briefed on, on the outworking of this. I think that, um, just to be clear around uh, the role of, of the Commissioner, it's responsible for an, a number of identified areas, which the member will be aware, um, appointing a panel of persons, all of whom are victims and survivors, whose function will be to provide a forum for consultation and discussion with victims and survivors. Um, that panel will be known as the advisory panel. Um, it also will, she also will be responsible for, for providing advice in matters concerning interests of victims and survivors and taking reasonable steps to ensure that victims and survivors are made aware of the functions of the Commissioner, the location of the Commissioner, um, and the ways in which the Commissioner can, they can communicate directly with the Commissioner. Um, she also will be undertaking or commission research into matters concerning the interests of victims and survivors, encouraging the provision and the coordination of provision of relevant services to victims and survivors, and then also making arrangements for publicising the role of the Redress Board, monitoring the, the operation of the Redress Board, and then establishing or making arrangements for establishing a panel of solicitors, the members of which the Commissioner is satisfied have the necessary expertise for providing legal advice and assistance to, um, on applications and also on appeals. The member will also be aware that in relation to um, those victims of, uh, that fell outside of the heart recommendations that there is an interdepartmental group that has been established under Judith Gillespie. And that's looking at the, all those people that are actually still to be, uh, uh, they still need to, to be supported and, and find a way forward. So we look forward to the work of that group um, coming forward and actually um, making recommendations to us about, about what we can do uh, next. So that work is ongoing, and you know that's a, a cross executive, it's an interdepartmental um, working group. You'll also understand that the Department of Health are the lead department 
um, on the work on mother and baby homes and Magdalen laundries, and that's also an ongoing um, piece of work. I call George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, <clears throat> could I thank the ministers for their statement? And could the deputy minister state if the new commissioner will have the ability to suggest new legislation if, during the course of discharging her duties as commissioner, she finds this would be helpful to carrying out the very important duties that <clears throat> would be bestowed on her? Thanks um, to the member again for um, his question. I think, again, as I said out there previously, the, 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 list, the remit of the Commissioner, and clearly um, the, the remit of the Commissioner at its core is to be the voice of victims, it's to listen to victims, it's to engage, and it's also to represent them, um, and to make sure that they have confidence and faith in the office of the Commissioner um, to address their needs. So when it comes to um, making legislative changes or anything that's required, then we will, listen, we will listen. Our door will be open to work with the Commissioner. Our door will be open to uh, make whatever necessary arrangements are required, legislatively or otherwise. To, but we want, to be, um, we want to say today very clearly to victims and survivors that your voice will always be heard. You will never be silenced again. And that this executive um, will uh, make sure that we leave no stone unturned in assisting you um, and, and the Commissioner in the way forward. Call Papa Sheehan. I thank the Minister for the statement uh, this morning. Uh, I wonder, could she advise why this appointment isn't coming into effect until the 14th of December? Uh, the member for the question. We actually we, we were keen that um, obviously that Ms Ryan would take up post um, very quickly, but because she has a, a current employment, she has to work out her notice. That's the only reason for the delay. Otherwise, we would um, have her in place today. But um, I think. The, the significance of today should not be um, lost. This is um, a significant public appointment which uh, we are delighted to be able to make and we hope that after this long awaited period that this is something that the victims will see as a step forward and a milestone in their journey. I call Trevor Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, and like others, can I join uh, in welcoming the fact that we have got to this stage. I am sure many thought this day would never come in terms of the appointment, so we all welcome the fact that uh, the, uh, that Fiona has been appointed to this post. But given the difficulties, uh, Deputy First Minister, around the interim advocate, advocate, do you believe that this is the right person for the job and she will have the confidence of the victims and survivors? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, you know, today isn't about the interim advocate, today is about the new uh, Commissioner coming into to place. Today is about a new beginning or a new chapter, and, and today is about giving hope that you know, finally things are being done. Um, and the needs of victims and survivors are being addressed insofar as we have this permanent appointment. Yes, both uh, myself and the Joint Head of Government, uh, Arlene Foster, we, we interviewed um, a panel of candidates. We were very um, satisfied that the appointment that we made is the right appointment. But clearly there will be, be a period to, to build confidence, to gain the confidence of the, of the victims and survivors. There will be work to done to, to build those relationships. But I think that uh, Ms Ryan um, certainly demonstrated to us that that is what she is about and she is someone with you know, a wealth of experience in working with people who have experienced trauma across a whole range of areas and I think that that will be, you know, will be testament and, and will stand her in, in her role as, as Commissioner and we wish her well and we wish that, uh, that the relationship flourishes between um, herself and the victims and survivors. I call Martina Anderson. Good and uh, thank you Minister for your statement and like Christopher Stalford, I actually was in the Assembly at the time that the Institutional Abuse Inquiry was launched. In fact, I had the privilege of being the junior minister, one of the two junior ministers that launched the inquiry uh, for the late Martin McGuinness and Peter Robison. So I do welcome this announcement today. As we all know, the victims have went through a long journey. Um, I hope that uh, Fiona Ryan will take to her new post, and I'm sure that Salvia uh, Sylvia and, and the other Northwest survivors groups and the others, the other victims groups, will all work well together now as they go forward. Minister, you outlined um, a number of applicants that had already applied. Could you give us some more information on the level of redress payment that has been made to date? Thanks um, to the member for her question. And in terms of um, redress, the as I said, the, it opened for, the board opened for applications on the 31st of March and we were delighted that um, seven weeks later the first compensation payments were made within the timescales set out by the President. Um, 
and we now know that um, numerous victims and survivors are now starting to receive the compensation that they are long overdue. The latest figures that we have are as at the 30th of September, 579 applications had been received, 156 of them from people who participated in the Heart Inquiry, and panels have made determinations totalling 4.1 million and paid out a total of 2.6 million. So we're very grateful to the President of the HIA Redress Board for continuing um, the prompt payment and assessment of applications and to those solicitors and groups that are supporting the applicants through this um, difficult process. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Mr Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for um, your statement today. Um, it is very, very welcome, uh, long overdue, and I'm absolutely delighted that we're at this uh, juncture. Um, we realise that the remit of the Commissioner is to be the representative voice of victims, but we also know that the victims of abuse, their families, um, have suffered greatly as well. Will the Commissioner have any remit in supporting the wider families, not just the, 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 the victims and the survivors? Their job is obviously to be um, the, the, the voice of victims, to, be, you know, to, to, to listen to them very carefully, to communicate that to government, to make sure that their interests are, are, are taken on board. I have no doubt that that would also include um, you know, the, the support circle around victims. Um, but I think that in terms of support services itself, this is something that is actually being looked at. And the interim advocate himself had actually brought forward a number of um, recommendations around that. And we need to continue to um, make sure that, that all the support services that are required um, are in place. I know that the interim advocate had been looking at um, what further support that could be um, service provision is needed for victims and survivors in line with the recommendations in the Hart Report, for example, around specialist services, and he put in place an interim personal support service um, with the Victims and Survivors Service, which offers both a listening ear and access to emotional support and counselling, and that can be accessed via the Interim Advocates Office or independently. Um, so officials are looking in the meantime then around how they can expedite preparations for um, making sure that the Commissioner will have key input into the services that are needed, so that would obviously include um, families also. I call Meg Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, thank you. May I welcome the Minister's statement, both very positive and uh, extremely significant, I think, in this, in this journey. As Mr Salford reminds us, it was the OFM-DFM Committee of the Day that scrutinised the legislation that set up heart. <clears throat> and I think we were all very conscious uh, that it was only open to victims who were abused in an institutional setting and that there were many other victims, perhaps of the same abusers, who did not have access to heart, not because of the nature of the abuse, but because of the location where it occurred. So uh, I hope the Minister would agree that there is an equality issue here. Uh, and further to what she said about Judith Gillespie and that interdepartmental group, could she expand on the terms of reference and the indicative timeline for reporting, please? Thanks to the member um, for his question. And again, um, it's really, really important that we send a very strong uh, message to victims and survivors that no one will be left out, that they'll never be silenced, and that their voice is heard here uh, in the Assembly and in the Executive. Um, I don't have the direct role or the direct terms of reference for the Interdepartmental Working Group with me, but I'm very happy to provide that to the member. But clearly, that's the, the, the role of the, of, of the Interdepartmental Working Group is to consider evidence in relation to all of these matters and then to make recommendations to to us and the executive. So uh, we look forward to, to getting that. Um, the time frame, um, I, I, again, I will respond to the member in writing around the time frame of the interdepartmental working group. But then alongside that is obviously the work that's happening in health, in the Department of Health around mother and baby homes and Magdalene laundries. No victim and survivor should be left behind. So we have an obligation to make sure that we progress all of this work in as speedy a manner as possible and that we allow um, victims and survivors to, to get to the point where they um, have the fullness of all the recommendations that were made in heart, so whether that's um, apology, redress, memorial, all the things that are significantly important to victims and survivors, I want us to deliver that as a matter of urgency. I call Gemma Dolan. Does the Minister regard the HIA apology as a public acknowledgement of the wrongdoing suffered in institutions? Yes, I, I mean, I think the delivery of an apology and public acknowledgement of harm and wrongdoing will be another significant uh, milestone for victims and survivors. And I think that the, the sooner we can get to that point, the better. We know that there's been a significant body of work done 
um, through the Interim Advocate uh, and working with the Victims and Survivors Group. They've also been looking at international best practice, so where else it's happened. Um, it's really, really important that whenever we, we deliver this apology, that it's delivered correctly and appropriately and that it, it actually meets the needs of, of the victims and survivors. So I believe that um, and over the course of the next uh, short number of weeks, uh, we have a meeting to discuss this and I hope to be able to come at some stage to, to the Assembly uh, to uh, update um, colleagues on where we are with that. But it's a really, really significant uh, fundamental part of the heart recommendations that we deliver an apology and uh, we're determined to do that. And I call Daniel McCrossan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the ministers for their statement as well. This is a significant announcement, and yes, one, as, uh, as has been said, is long overdue. I'd like to commend the victims, those who have stood strong through very difficult times and have suffered continually uh, throughout the years. This will come uh, as welcome news today, and also to wish Ms. Ryan well in her difficult and challenging job that lies ahead. Can I ask uh, the Minister, is there any intention to increase the budget for the office given the numbers of people involved? Additional staffing would help, and I know you have touched on that uh, earlier as well, but just to give an assurance to those who are affected that there will be no barriers uh, in terms of the resources necessary to support the Commissioner in her vital and necessary work. Thank the member. We are determined to support the Commissioner in, in her work and budgets will, will all be worked out in, in line with you know, the, the needs of the office, the needs of victims and what we can do to support them. So I, I, I thank you for your acknowledgement that this is, um, you know, I have no doubt this is a day, this is a day for, um, for the victims and survivors. It's them that have brought us to this point. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm standing here today as, as Joint Head of Government able to make this announcement. Um, but rec in recognition that it has been a long time coming, but this is a significant day. And to all the victims and survivors, thank you for everything that you have done to get us to this point today in, in your tenacity and the courage that you have shown and your resilience that you have shown uh, for, for many, many years in the face of all the adversity that you, that you have faced. And, and it's right that, that we're making this um, announcement today, and I'm glad that we're at this point, but we have a few more things to do, uh, not least the apology and the memorial. I want to get us to that point alongside all the other work that needs to happen for those people that don't fall within the terms of the Heart um, Inquiry itself. I call Jim Allister. Um, I trust this will prove a more successful appointment than that of the Interim Commissioner. And arising from the disastrous breakdown between many of the victims and the Interim Commissioner, what lessons have been learned and what mechanisms are in place to deal with such a situation if it should unfortunately arise again? Well, let's, let's hope that today is a, is a new beginning and that when Ms Ryan comes into post as the Commissioner, that the relationship between herself and the victims flourishes. Today isn't about yesterday or it isn't about the interim advocate. It's very much about how do we support victims and survivors in the period ahead. And that's what I, what I am focused on. What I want us to do is that we have a situation where all victims feel that they have a place, that they have a voice that is directly communicated with ourselves in the executive. That's what we're determined to do. This is a hugely significant day. Let's look to the future. Let's assist victims and survivors to look to the future. Let's help them rebuild. Let's deliver on the commitments that were made in the Heart uh, Report. And let's make sure that we're continually looking forward and assisting them in all that they do. And I call Claire Sugden. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I uh, welcome the appointment. Um, I appreciate both ministers bringing it to the floor of the House today. I think that's an important and significant um, statement to make. Um, I'm also impressed by Ms. Ryan's background, not least her experience within domestic abuse. Um, institutional abuse is comparable with domestic abuse, not least because it's an abuse of trust for those people who should have been protecting those children. Um, the compensation will go some way to acknowledging the, the wrongdoings against these individuals, but I think there is significant trauma here, and in order to heal, we need to put more resources into addressing that trauma those, for those individuals. So will they be able to access resources such as counselling or legal services uh, through the Commission? So as I said earlier, uh, in response to another um, answer, that uh, the interim advocate has been looking at what support services are there, um, what is missing, what needs to be replaced, and then I suppose the resource conversation would follow the identification of need. Um, but clearly this is something that we all prioritise, this is, this is something that we know is a hugely uh, emotive area of, of work that we do and, and if, if we suppose if we, if we just make that firm commitment to be 
uh, as responsive as we possibly can be and to support the needs of victims and survivors as they are identified by the Commissioner. I think that's the, I suppose, the, the commitment that I could give today. Okay, members, that concludes questions on the statement. I could ask members to take your ease for a few minutes and uh, while we're waiting on the next. Uh